Um, I actually attended um, the University of Melbourne. Um, I was one of the first, I, I think you guys would have heard about, I know Ed is trying to change the course to be look more like Melbourne's course, um, in the sense that you have a general uh, undergraduate degree. So I started in the first year of that intake. Um, it was very new and novel and um, I didn't know what to make of it. I, when, I, when I left uh, high school, I knew I was, like a lot of you in this room, probably strong with maths and science. Um, and everyone said, oh, do engineering, it's, it's good. I didn't know why I wanted to do engineering. I just, I just picked it, um, probably because people were career exposed and um, Open Day said engineering is good, it, it matches your skill set. Um, so I went along with it. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I went and I studied a Bachelor of Science. It was a very general degree. We did parts of engineering, we did parts of science, we did parts of humanities, and that gave me a good grounding. It gave me a good, I guess, appreciation of different aspects within the university. Um, it also set up my career in a sense that it let me know that whilst engineering was my, I guess, specialisation, um, I was actually interested in more the business side of things. Going to microeconomics lectures, going to project management lectures, that's what drew me to the course. Um, so I, I continued along my journey. I went on and I specialised in a Master of Civil Engineering. I, um, I majored and um, specialised in Civil Engineering itself. Um, but along the way, I, I took in a lot of economics courses, a lot of accounting courses, and that also gave me a basis for how I work now. So I think it's important that I know there's like this subject, um, like other subjects in your course, it's been set up to give you a bit of a taste. You don't have to be proficient in those areas, but a little bit of a taste of the different areas that the university has to offer. And I think it's really important. It gives you that more roundedness as an engineer moving forward. I know once you go and apply for jobs and you sit in the interviews um, and you have your um, applications for summer school and vacation programs and whatnot, the first thing they ask is, what do you do different to everyone else? It's not coming in here at 9am and learning the engineering course. Everyone's done that, or well, they assume everyone's done that. It's those extra co-curricular things, it's those extra areas of knowledge that you can bring to the table that sets you apart from your competitors, pretty much. Um, so I've been, I've, since, since graduating, I've, um, I'm a member of Engineers Australia, that's a little bit of fluff to just fill the uh, resume, anyone can do that. Um, I'm now a registered building practitioner, um, so I've gone along and I, that qualification along with um, your chartered engineering degree, it just gives you, I guess, credibility in the field, you're able to sign documentation off, it just gives you that little bit of status that, that, that just sets you apart and it allows you to, it gives a little bit more credence to what you're saying out on site. Going, going back, I think one of the good, and speaking to your professor, um, on our various dinners and whatnot. Um, I think one of the good aspects of this course, as opposed to where I went, was that whilst my course was heavily focused on the theory, I think that this university has a better grasp on the realities of workplace experience. And one of the things I did, um, I guess off my own merit, um, and I had a lot of people telling me it was the right thing to do, and obviously it was, um, I, I took in some work experience over my final two years of my course. My course was a five year degree. And in the summer of the third and fourth years, um, I actually worked in a design engineering consultancy um, company. So that was um, a company called Bonacci Group, and they do quite, a, quite substantial projects in and around, especially Victoria, but in and around Australia. If not the world, they've got a few offices overseas as well. And that gave me a taste of what engineering in its purest form had to offer. Um, it gave me the skills that I was able to transfer back into fourth and five, fifth year. I had to do a research project. Um, it was a very boring topic, actually. Um, it was on uh, this Melbourne soils and the, um, the geology of Melbourne soils. I'm, I'm not into research. That wasn't for me. I, I picked the wrong university for research, actually, um, because my, my uni was fully focused to research, and I, I hated it. I absolutely despised it. Um, so I pretended to do a, a research topic, but I, I focused more towards... Um, the teamwork subjects, I had a, a year-long subject that was all about working within a team and collaborative learning. I love that. that. That's where my passion was, not in the, in the getting, a, um, getting a journal paper written for another professor. I had no, no interest in that. Um, I've just put up here that I'm Secretary of the Victorian Amateur Football Association. Umpires Association, you might look at that and say, that's who cares, it's, it's not related to engineering, who, who gives you stuff. Um, 
it takes up a lot of my time, much to um, his brother's annoyance. Who's, <laughs> I'll introduce him properly. Um, Rashad, who's Dr. Kasadik's brother, is my director at Vert Engineering. So we work very closely. We actually work together at Bonacci Group and we are moving into, into Vert. Um, he took me across and we're, we're, we're working there now. I work, I work as a secretary at the Umpire Association. It's, it's an association filled with 450 members and we've got to deal with a large cross-section cross of people. So we have people that are as young as 18 years old all the way up to 60 years old. And giving you those interpersonal skills to be able to speak to them, talk to them, know how they interact with one another, dealing with ASIC, who's the financial um, taxation officer, to be able to put in your balance sheet. Even those sort of things that gave me those skills that um, putting in BAS statements, it gave me those skills that were able to be transferred. So whilst I might not know how to run a $50 million uh, engineering company, I've been exposed to those little things that you need to tick off along the way. So just put that, what, that, what that was there for is to show that I do do other things and it's really important that when you are in your course that you do do other things. I'm sure all of you might play sport, be in a band, do, do anything else. It's really important that you continue to do that because that is what sets you apart in those interviews. That is what the interviewees are actually interested in. I know when I, I, I interview young graduates, I, I know that they're going to be able to fill out the latest formula or, or calculus form. I know that, I, I assume that they know that. What I ask in the interviews is, what else do you like to do? And that you can really pick up a good grasp of what they are actually interested in. So I think it's really important that you continue doing that, or if you don't, get into something that will, will push you, um, get you out of your comfort zone, um, and also give you some experience in something other than engineering. Go back to more of a, I guess, a, a design point of view. Um, what do I do? So I, I guess all of you have a basic understanding of what civil engineers do. Um, but basically, as a civil engineer, we're interested with everything below the ground. So we, there's civil engineers that work on dams, um, railway tunnel, you see all the metro rail tunnels in the city, they'll have a lot of engineers working on it. The company that I'm at, we're a bit of a more small scale company. Um, we deal with, at the coalface with all the um, developers and builders face to face. So we'll deal with a lot of the commercial projects around the city, a lot of the apartments that are going up in and around Melbourne CBD and the suburbs. Um, we deal with a lot of hospitals, schools, um, what else do we do? Quite, quite a lot of like, um, big townhouse subdivisions. So we're more into that side of, of the field. Prisons, we've done a prison. A zoo? We have done a zoo, yeah. Oh. I, was, I was involved in a zoo and then doing an elephant enclosure. That was, that was funny. Um, so basically, as I said, structure, pretty much above ground, civil, below ground. Um, there are different, uh, I guess, standards in which you have to adhere to, um, but it's all around the same sort of thing, and you use the same sort of skill sets in both professions. We work very closely with the, stru with the structural guys. We're a, we're a structural and civil design consultancy, so I come from the civil arm of that. So, as I mentioned, um, we, we, we specialise in unit site developments, we talk about on-site detention, which, if you don't know, um, Melbourne has a big problem with undersized assets. So when it rains, water goes to the asset too quickly, so we slow that down. Um, we do a lot of basement retention design works and stormwater management, designing basements. Every new apartment block has two, three, even some up to four um, layers or floors of basements, so we do all that design. Um, we do road and pavement design, so we've done quite a bit of work. Um, for the Western Distributor, you might have heard of that project at the moment. Uh, we do quite a bit of work uh, managing with Vic Roads and all the different authorities um, that you come to terms with. Um, and also, what a sense of urban design. Now, that's, that's an area that I guess our firm is sort of being a, a leader, I guess, in. Um, what a sense of urban design is to make sure that um, the buildings that are today are built with the future in mind. Myself and Rashad, we have this, uh, I guess, mantra, and it's to design like an engineer, but think like a builder. So how that means is a lot of engineers and a lot of contractors will come to engineering, and engineers, and they'll get the same blunt, bland message from them. They're not willing to help them. They're not willing to point them in the right direction. They're not willing to actually do 
anything above their allotted time hours to get the project over the line. But that's not how you get work in the future. And we'll move on to, in, in, later in my slides, there's about how you get work. And it's important that you maintain and you build the relationships with the clients and with the, with the builders in particular, because you're working with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you think like them and you have their, I guess, their problems at the forefront of your mind, you're going to give, develop a much better product for them and they're going to come back to you. It's no point getting a client for one job and that you never see them again. You want that repeat work, and it's only by developing strong bonds with them, knowing what they want, not being just submissive to whatever they say and say, yes, yes, sir, we'll, we'll do whatever you want. You've obviously got to um, act with uh, your in engineering integrity and, and be able to develop a proper, strong product. But it's just having that mindset that you've got to keep them in mind in whatever you do. It goes a long way into, into the rest of um, your career path. I briefly touched on what a sense of urban design and what it is, um, but basically in its purest form, um, we all know obviously what stormwater is, stormwater falls um, onto the surface, it's, it's, it's dealing with surface water. Um, we deal a little bit with in-ground water, but this is surface water. As you see in the diagram, 100 years ago, or 150 years ago, when all the drains were designed in Melbourne, they were designed for the area and the topography that it was currently at the time. So at that, at that point in time, you had a lot more pervious area throughout Melbourne. A lot of the water fell onto the, I guess, pervious area, even a few hard surfaces, and most of that would infiltrate into the soil. So, and before going into the water table and the base flow. Now, with every day, hundreds of buildings being popped up, new apartment blocks being put up all the time, subdivided sites being um, overcapitalised and whatnot around in and around Melbourne, you have a higher concentration of impermeable area. What that does is the effect from an environmental point of view is that it speeds up water getting into the reservoirs, dams, um, Melbourne's water infrastructure, and it can't cope. And it's that thoughtful design into the future by different measures that we employ on site at the source rather than at the end node is what we do, is one of our things that will differentiate what we do as a, as a company. Just move on to the, the impacts of this. I'm, I'm just touching into water sense of urban design just as one macro issue of our company that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, just one form of what we do. I just want to give you a little bit of a taste before I move on to more of the economic side. So some of the impacts of war water sensitive urban design, or poor design, I should say, is that it causes waterways to have reduced flow most of the time. It's just altering the water table to unsatisfactory levels. It can also make beaches unsuitable for swimming, um, and it changes the habitat of fauna and flora and erodes stream banks and degrades streams due to water getting there too quickly. So it's something that, that it is a problem facing a lot of uh, I know Mel we work very closely with Melbourne Water. It's a problem that we face on a day-to-day -day basis and we, something that we need to do um, as part of every of our designs to make sure that the risks and the, and the things are mitigated. We have a few various options that are available um, for our design and we touch on, um, with any development, we, we design rainwater tanks, rain gardens, sediment ponds, wetlands and swales. They're all little different things that um, we implement um, and design at a real core level um, to be able to get the, the project on track. Why I mention this is that, as you can see, the works as an engineer are very detailed. It can be very detailed, but it also can be very as much high level as you want to make it. The, the nitty gritty of engineering I love, I do it from a day to day basis, but it's not what drives me and it's not what um, gets me out of bed in the morning, it's not what makes me early or late to work. Um, so it's important that obviously you learn the core parts of your engineering and what you're learning, but also taking that, that mindset. Just a few jobs I've worked on in the past um, couple of years, we've worked very closely with um, Epworth Richmond Redevelopment, um, and that was an interesting job, it was a six, $600 million project um, in Erin Street in, in Richmond, I know that most of you probably heard of of Epworth. Um, it's one of Australia's largest 
um, private hospitals. Actually, in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, I think it's the largest private hospital in the Southern Hemisphere, the whole conglomerate of Epworth. Um, that was an interesting project. As I said before, um, we've done quite a bit of work with... Um, our, our core business will feature around stormwater and making sure that the site adequately drains. But we were actually tested on this job um, just because apart from stormwater and um, managing the flooding issues of building a six-level basement, um, so the, the, the ground went actually 50 or so metres into the ground. Um, we excavated out into hard rock into, into Richmond. Um, it actually took it was almost eight months to, to excavate the, eight, the, um, the, the actual basement cut out. Um, we actually had to design an oxygen line um, on that job. So feeding oxygen direct from the source, the tank, that couldn't be, couldn't be situated anything close to surgical, surgical equipment because of the effects that it could possibly explode. We had to, we had to build an oxygen tank off-site and then through inner city Melbourne streets, divert a new oxygen line to the hospital to feed the whole hospital. That was something I'd never dealt with before, something that never anyone taught me in engineering. Um, it, was not, it wasn't in Australian standards, it hadn't been done before. So we had to extract the principles that we've worked out with other services and sort of incorporate them in, but with added risks. If oxygen blows, explodes under the ground, have a devastating and catastrophic effect. So that was actually a quite, it was a learning curve, that, um, that project, because whereas before you could always obviously go to your manager or go to your director and ask, how would you approach this situation? In that, in that time, it was like, oh, I haven't done it before, you, you go work it out. And that was, as a graduate, that was quite daunting because you might be surprised, but a lot of the, the managers that you go to, they might not necessarily care that you don't succeed, if that makes sense. They, they're, they're, some of them, some of them are great, but some of them are there for themselves as well. So the industry is a very dog-eat-dog -dog world. Um, and, and, and not having that person to rely on to be able to go to, what did you do here? Can I copy-paste an old job that you did um, and just copy it? It was, was, quite, was quite different. Uh, we also worked on the Victorian uh, Comprehensive Cancer Centre in Parkville. That was a, a $1.2 billion project um, near Melbourne Uni. It's um, near um, Flemington Road. Now, that um, had some bridge links over some large Vic Roads assets and, and getting a bridge over a Vic Roads asset um, can't be understated. The Vic Roads are a very <laughs> difficult um, authority to deal with um, and that had its troubles um, as well. As Eddie said, uh, we've worked on a, a prison out in Hopkins Correctional Facility. Um, that prison is an amazing prison actually. Um, it's, it's a prison for sexual offenders and sexual abuse, um, I guess, offenders. But the facilities that they have there are quite phenomenal. Um, it's not, this is not something that should be joked about. It's a, it's a very serious crime and whatnot, but it's, it's, it's like a five-star hotel. It literally is like a five-star hotel. And we couldn't believe when we were designing that had tennis courts, swimming pools, gyms, saunas. It was like, why would the government be doing this for them? And that comes back to the ethics of engineering. It's whilst you see, you might not believe in your head that they deserve it, or they do it, you obviously still need to do a good job. You're working for a client. At that point, we're working for the federal government in, co in co um, collaboration with the state government. And you come to work and you'd be designing these things and you think to yourself, gee, I, I, I can't believe I'm designing this for, for these people. Um, so that, that, that actually caught me from more of an ethical point of view than anything else. Um, we've done quite a few um, LB stores, and they, LB is a big, like, um, obviously you know what LB is, but um, they've rolled out thousands of stores across Australia. And LB, whilst they're, I can say this here, they're smart German people, um, they also can be quite naive. Um, they buy every site um, in full, and they will buy a thousand sites at a time. And they will go out and they'll buy whatever piece of land they can get their hands on. They don't look into the feasibility of the land. They don't look into the flooding risks. They don't look into um, whether or not you can do adequate um, dis uh, disability design for the site because it might be on the side of a cliff. They don't look into any of that. They say, engineer, make it work. Um, so you'll send it, they'll give you a design and you'll be, you'll be scratching your head and trying to make it work. But 
what was what, what LB did was it showed you how to work on tight time frames, um, high expectations from the client, and every job was different. They thought it was the same, but every job was different. So it was recalibrating their um, ideas and making sure that they knew that you couldn't just, as I said, copy and paste. We do quite a few multi-unit townhouse developments. They're our bread and butter. We smash them out in, in a day if Richard, his brother, sees that I'm taking too long of that, I'll be straight on the straight on the phone as to why I'm not getting them out there. They're just we have them, have them all the time. Um, and finally we deal we're the engineer for we're the main principal engineer for APA gas. So they're the gas distributors that, that distribute gas to all of Victoria. Um, we are dealing with all their substations, power stations, um, deal all with all the design of their offices. So we're their main go-to people. So that's that's quite it's quite an interesting I guess, diverse portfolio that we, we have. Um, it allows us to go into meetings and when we speak to clients and builders and developers and state governments to give a, give a showcase of the different things that we do, the different sectors we deal with. Um, it gives us a good all-rounded, um, I guess, um, CV that we can um, give to potential people. As I mentioned before, engineering is different to me as it is to you, as it is to Eddie. We all do engineering for different reasons. Some of you might not even work in engineering and that's fine. Engineering in its purest form is the application of scientific knowledge to solve problems in the real world. But that's just one facet of what I like to do. That's not what I want to become. I don't want to be an engineer until I'm 65 and then retire. I like to think of myself as a design engineer that's start and at heart, and that's my grounding and basis, but more moving towards what an entrepreneurial engineer is. And you might have talked about this in your classes, I'm not too sure yet. The difference between an entrepreneurial engineer and a design engineer in its purest form is that entrepreneurial engineering will open a lot more doors. You can always go back to doing design engineering, but until, until you start making the first few steps of being an entrepreneurial engineer, you'll just be crunching numbers for the whole of its entirety. It allows you to be more self-employed. I know self-employment might not be for everyone, um, but it's something that I like to do and it's something that I want to become. Gives you more flexibility and time and be able to resource and manage your own time. And, it, and more importantly, it gives you the ability to control your own destiny and where you want to go. And that's really important to me. I don't want to be doing engineering just for the sake of making um, some others lots of money. Um, it also gives you, as I said, the ability to integrate different industries and becoming a more rounded engineer. So what are the qualities, I think, of an entrepreneurial engineer? One is that they must possess analytical and planning skills. And this is a must. And resource management and time management is very important. I'll get to that later, what we do. <coughs> must work well in dynamic and rapidly changing conditions. Every day I go into work and something's changed. I can plan to do A, B and C and I've got to go into work and do D, E and F. I, my whole routine's out of whack, but I need to be able to adapt. Otherwise I won't be able to perform well. Got to work well under pressure and in short time frames, otherwise I'll get into trouble. Um, and work effectively across multiple organisations. The main thing is you've got to be willing to learn and grasp new things. I like, probably a lot like you, like comfort and like our comfort zone. Doing things like this, I, I do it, but it's out of comfort zone. But it's important that you try it and you do it because it's only that getting out of your comfort zone, only designing those um, oxygen lines out of stormwater and not saying, I can't do it, I just give up, that allows you to give yourself a better um, position later in life. Good communication skills, both oral and written. Um, my written is probably better than my, my oral form, um, as you can probably tell, and goal orientated. I'm very goal orientated. I know where I want to be, where I want to be, get to, and I put every measure I can to get to that point. If you don't have goals, you're just going, you're, you're running in the straight line to nowhere. So you've got to be goal orientated, you've got to know where you want to go, you've got to know where you want to come from. I'll move more into the, I guess, the small business side of engineering, and there's something that I've, as I said, I'm passionate about, um, and something that drives me um, and allows me um, to get those additional skills. When I'm 
when you when you're in a design engineering office and when you become a manager you don't just design you got to think about how the business is going to make money if you don't make money you don't get more jobs you don't you're not able to put on more staff you're not able to um, actually function as a, as, a, as a company and we have this thing in, in our firm at bird engineering is sort of the life cycle of um, engineering work and, and this is a, a cycle that repeats first we start off with a fee submission so we'll send and we'll quote some work so that's some client will be referred to us and we provide a fee. Very basic start. That will get accepted and we start doing the job. And then it's all about efficient resource management. If you're not efficient, if you don't get the work done on time, if you use too much resource, you're not making money, there's no point being open as a business. Once this, once this is finished and you've completed the job, you've got to invoice it, you put progress claims in, um, you're getting the money back, and then the most important thing is the review costs and evaluation. That's the most important thing. If we don't review it, we just go on, we do our job, we quote for 10 hours of work, we take 50, we don't look at it, we, we throw the information into the bin and repeat. It's what a lot of uh, some directors that I've worked with in the past do. You become in this cycle that you continually lose money. And, and I come from a very, I guess, well, what can I say, a, a liberal, conservative, economic value basis in the sense that money drives the economy. And if the builders are making money, we're going to be making money because the builders are going to start building. They're not going to build if they're not, there's no profit or margin or gain for them. So it's important that they are making profit, and we do, so that we can continue the process and be able to make sure that we're successful into the future. So it's that repeating costs, going through the process, and just making sure that you, whatever you do, be it work that you do at uni, um, just reviewing how you went, where you could do better, and just not repeating the same mistakes. I think that's very important, because we say, I see a lot of mistakes being repeated in the industry, and you think, why are you doing the same thing? We've lost it so many times before, don't repeat it. But until they learn, we just stay in that one circle. I'll just go into how I, um, I guess, provide fee proposals. Um, this might be of interest to you, might not. When, as, as a mid-tier manager, you obviously get the job in um, and you've got to provide a fee. Now, that fee is very important. It's, it might take you five minutes, it might take you three days, it might take you a week to prepare the fee. But that fee is what will be the success or the demise of your business. And some people, uh, very, don't, I guess, take that into account. They just chuck a fee in, oh, we'll make money, we'll make it work. Well, unless you do the proper research and the proper background theory, you're not going to make it work. When you have an insufficient fee, you lead to, you lead to a project that the one, the employee is going to be, if, if, hypothetically, just say, we put in a low fee for a job. As a design engineer, I know that I'm not going to be able to make money on that job. So from the start, my, 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 my morale might be low on the job. Um, we're not going to make uh, any profit for the company. We're not going to make anything for the, for the business. The time frame might be too harsh. They might have said we can get it done in a week when you can only get it done um, in three or four weeks. So that's why it's important that you do it properly. There's a few um, measures that you take, must take into account uh, when you're providing any fee. Now, one is the scope and the value of the work. So that's pretty self-explanatory. A bigger job is a higher fee. The complexity of the job is also pretty obvious. Um, the more complex the job, the bigger the fee, or smaller the fee for a more simple job. Now, one that's interesting, and a lot of people don't take into account, is the geographical location of the job. If the job's in Melbourne, in the CBD, our office is based in Canterbury, I can get to and from a meeting, I can go on site at the click of a finger. I can get there in 20 minutes, I can get back in 20 minutes. If the job's in Echuca, I can't do the same thing. I can't get out on site, it'll take me a whole day as opposed to taking me two hours. So the geographical location of the job will dictate where it is and how much you're going to put towards it. The ground conditions and possible contamination also um, leaves a role. We, we've done quite a number of jobs over our time and we have a basic, pretty good knowledge of what you're going to experience in different um, conditions. If you go into the west, they have pretty poor soils. 
Um, they have soils that are more contaminated. They have soils that you need to be able to um, engineer around to get the same result. And we know that if we had a job we're doing quite a bit of work um, in and around Port Melbourne, they have a lot of Coot Island silt. And with Coot Island silt, you, um, you need to design your stormwater pipes so that it allows for a lot of movement in the soil. So things like that is extra detailing, extra talking to um, manufacturers, extra meetings on site so that the builder knows exactly how to do it. You need to allow for that. If you don't allow for that, you're not going to be in a good place. I put down here the status of the client. Now, we're, as I mentioned before, we're very, very, we have a lot, a lot of variance in our, in our work and who we build for and who we um, design our stuff for. Now, I put down here the difference in a seasoned contractor and a mum and dad builder. We, we have um, jobs with the state government that they tender out to, um, your Grocons, your multiplexes and whatnot. They have their own team of project managers, their own team of site foremans, their own um, site supervision, um, people that have done lots of jobs time and time again. So you know that you're not going to be needed every day and hold their hand through the whole process, as opposed to, I say, a mum and dad builder who it's their first job, it's their prize, it's their puppy, it's their, it's their house that they've been saving up 15 years to be able to build and they finally got to build it and they've given you the engineering and you've got to make it work because otherwise they're going to be so distraught and it's, 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 it's a horrible thing. Um, so you've got to be with them a lot further along the way. You've got to be there on site, responding to RFIs every day, um, holding their hand a little bit more, but you've got to allow for that. So when we, when we put our fee submissions for what we say construction phase services, which is um, that we have a design fee and then a construction fee, um, we might um, have a little bit less on the fee for the season builder because we, this might, might not be needed as much. And obviously the urgency of the job, if you need to get it out quickly, we need to put more resources on it, we need to pay for that. Keeping projects on time and on budget, I said it's very important and it is very important. Um, it's important that we put realistic time frames on our projects. It's, it's no good saying, as I said, we can get it out in one day when it's going to take a week because that puts unrealistic expectations on your staff, but also it puts unrealistic expectations on the end goal, on the client, because they think that you're going to get it to them in that time frame and they're automatically disappointed when you don't. It's our, our business is all about people managing and being able to maintain relationships, so you don't want to let them down. So we, we, we do the, um, the old, old trick of over, over, under-promising under and over-delivering. Um, I mentioned it's allocating the right resources at the right time, um, and it's planning who is going to do what to reduce insufficient overlaps in the project. Um, we only commence jobs, or we try to only commence jobs when all the relevant information is being provided. Um, that just stops us from doing um, laborious work that we're going to have to repeat anyway. Um, and we, the important thing is, when we're dealing with all the authorities with Melbourne Water, with council and whatnot, we liaise with them throughout the whole process. We keep them informed, so when they get the de drawings on their desk, they're not looking for it the first time and taking their six to eight weeks. They're being kept abreast the whole time so that the, their approval process will be um, important. I know from myself and my team, we, um, we work with um, setting our daily goals and we have Google spreadsheets, we use the Wonderlist app, um, we use quite a lot of technology to be able to effectively know what we want to do for that day and then how we're going to move forward in the week and then month and then year. So effective um, planning, communication, talking to one another is all the metrics that we use um, to be able to keep the job on time and on budget and that's what's important for my role within the company. Probably bored half of you but um, I'll now open up to any questions or anything that you may have um, about what I do, where I've come from, my, um, my engineering background.